The Titanomachy, Act Two. The forces of the Titans and the gods of Olympus are at war. Mighty Zeus and his brothers, Hades and Poseidon, stand against the court of the king of the universe, Kronos, lord of the Titans. For half a decade, the forces of the Olympians have grown. Their numbers, their experience, their power. Yet, only today have they faced the armies of the king head on. Only today have the Titans managed to best the Olympians thoroughly. Night falls, and on Mount Othrys, the celebrations reach near fever pitch. As the victorious armies of the Titans drink and brag about their actions of the day, their king looks on in disgust, for they all look to Iapetus as a hero, a leader, a victor. And something dark, clawed and evil stirs inside Cronos's chest. He stands and tips his goblet in the direction of the champions of the day. Strong Atlas, swift Menetius, daring Prometheus, dashing Pallas. A fixed smile on his face as he lords his men. And yet, when he looks to Iapetus, his countenance then shifts. And he beckons his general, his brother, to stand at his side. And he raises up his and Atlas's arm in victory. But then drops it with a nonchalance that puzzles all who look on. Kronos's gait widens, his smile falls, and his face contorts into a sneer. A pity I was not on the field today. Befuddled on Ambrosia, Iapetus does not note the change in mood. You, my king, my brother, you were not needed. We crushed them and saw the backs of their heels. They are beneath your contempt, my king. At this, the crowd cheers and toasts to Iapetus, the hero of the hour. And yet, were I upon the field, perhaps we would have won this day. But, my lord, we did win this day. Now... You force them to run, as you have done for some half decade or more. You let them escape. Iapetus then sobered quickly and took a step down, away from the face his king has made. A contorted sneer of utter contempt, he then shone on his entire court. None daring to meet his gaze when it was upon them. You had them, all of them, collected in one place, in your very crutches, the palms of your hands. Yet you permitted them to escape again. Brave Pallas and Perseus brag about besting Vera, his own daughter. Epimetheus was beaten down by Zelos, Aegeon by Kratos, Astraeus by Hades. Yet you call this a victory. The three were there, in one place. They marched towards you. My own brothers, their sons, my beasts of war, my entire army. Yet, where is the helm of Kratos, or the eyes of Styx, the hair of Vera, or the wings of Nike of victory? You could not bring me one head. Not one. If this is how my army serves its master, perhaps I should get on my belly and crawl to Mount Olympus, climb the stairs on my knees, spread myself on the ground before the curds. You drink and roust and wag your tongues in my house, in my home. 
Yet where are the spoils of war? Where are they? Even now my Axie is dead. Even now my spies tell me Zeus cuts off its skin to cover a shield. He wears my pet's pelt. And you call this a victory? And Iapetus was cowed. His head down, he looked at the floor. All of them did. The king then rose to his fullest height and looked imperilously on. Kronos then swept from the room, but no buzz of chatter followed. The celebrations were over. Hera. I witness the crushing defeat of our forces, yet even this well cannot see within the realms of the mounts, either Othris or Olympus. Wards and enchantments cloud my vision from either. I sit, thinking, for too long have we done nothing. And it is clear that even with the assistance of the Grandmother, of Gaia, even with all the forces my brothers have gathered, they are no match for the Titans. Long do I sit, long do I consider the strands of fate, that which is at stake. Decision made. I gather my sisters. We speak and I make my case. They know the stakes. They know what has been agreed. And unanimously, we come to our conclusion. So, we seek out the Queen of the Seas. We seek out Tethys. We move as one, approaching her throne as she reclines. She is surrounded by nymph attendants, serenaded by a choir of oceanids. She is the center of their universe. As we three, I, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia, glide up the stairs to the throne, Tethys looks down on us and greets us with a warm and welcoming smile. But we see it die in her eyes as the king strides into the throne room with purpose. He walks briskly, past us, looking only at his queen. An embassage from our brother. They come. The queen responds. Now, children, array behind my husband and I. We quicken our stride and do as instructed, standing behind and to the side of the thrones of the king and queen. A whole flanks of the king's guard are arrayed around the stairs and walls. None may approach us. The embassage from the king marches into the room. Two columns of warriors arrayed in full arms. They form a corridor for their leaders, the ambassadors, to walk towards the bottom of the stairs. The king's guard there then cross their spears in a clear sign, and the two of them stop. I know them from my time with the mirrors. It is Aegean and hated Minetius. Wind and war. A declaration of sorts by their mere choice as heralds. The king, Kronos, shows his teeth. Welcome, titans of the court of Kronos. And the young titan, Menetius, can't help himself but interrupt the lord of the seas. The king. You meant to say, welcome, titans of the court of Kronos, the king. The guards at the foot of the stairs, all of those standing around the walls, act in unison. All take one step forward and raise their spears. Menetius, to his credit, does not even flinch. The Lord of the Seas stands and waves his men to stand down, but not to lower their weapons. It is either a brave or very stupid being that threatens a king in his own court. Aegean steps forward. We represent the only true king, the Lord of Mount Othris, Kronos. 
You owe fealty to him, your liberator. You are king of the waves only by his sufferance. And yet here, my word is law. And you would do well to remember that. Heralds of my brother or no. It is in his name we are here, only to find you harboring his enemies. At that, he looks at us, the three Olympians, with venom, then back to the king. Your children hove to Zeus in their hundreds. Aye. But are they not also represented amongst your own armies? They may not take kindly to finding out your lord threatens their home, and parents both. We make no threats. We speak plain. And only of thee, Okeanus. None other. Only thee. What have you to say to that, King of the Seas? If my brother wishes to fight a war on two fronts, then by all means, he can come down here and take it up with me, personally. I do not answer to his lackeys. The one of the winds sneers and spits back. You will regret those words. Perhaps. But not today. And then Okeanus leant forward on his throne and spat. Now, get out of my oceans! And with that, the two turn on their heel and show their backs to the king and queen, an insult that would lead any other to swift death. But they are permitted to leave, and so they do. The king then looks to his queen. His face is now calm as the two of them share a deep and foreboding silent look. The queen speaks. We were to remain neutral. I, my queen, we were. And we are still. But I will not bandy words with his peons. I will not bow to that tyrant. You know this. Yes, I do. But it was not politic. We know the prophecies. We need only hope that the young lion can find his strength soon. Let us hope it is soon. The wails of the mother cannot be ignored forever. They may end this world. Aye. Let us hope it is soon. The king then nods to us, winking at me. He is strong. He may know of our minds, our will. And when he is fully gone, the queen turns to us Olympians. We know what brings you here. We know all that happens under the seas. We know of your intentions. I respond. Then you will not stop us? Nay, we are neutral in all things. Yet, this display on behalf of our brother... Kronos, it will not sit well with many of our court. Go, but go not quietly, and see how many of the court take up your cause. For you will need to bring forces to the fray, if you are to assist them. My sisters and I curtsy, and then turn to leave, the queen imparting one last line in whispers only we can hear. Do not take the field openly, for as long as you can. You do not wish to face the Titanesses yet. The mother may not endure if they match to you. Metis. Titaness of good counsel walked the halls of Othris to find her lord. He was, as always, looking out of his main windows, down on the plains of Thessaly, across to the only thing he could truly really be gazing upon, Mount Olympus, the home of his rebel sons. He turned as she walked into the room. More to put it, another face came from his head and twisted toward her movements. The second face then shimmered and moved around to join the original. 
and Kronos did not look again, but merely stated, What omens of the day, sister? Metis walked to his side and reported, whilst looking out at the same vista. The omens are mixed, my lord. We do not advise a clash. Indeed. How so? Phoebe has taken the auspices, viewed entrails, looked into the stars. The Olympians will array for war this day. If a clash occurs, then there will be a mighty victory, but only after a crushing defeat. Now interpret for me, Metis. What do your gifts tell you? Whomever leads out your armies to war will not return and only then will a victory of another sort be possible. But a more serious blow than a mere besting on the field, a deeper wounding to the cause of your sons. And you have told none? As always, my lord, yours are the first and only ears, which hear are words of wisdom. Make sure that is the truth of the matter or you will serve a sentence far worse than that of Rhea. You are not my wife, and I am not Clement. Remember that. Yes, my lord. Hera. It is happening. Finally, the portents are in alignment. My brothers did not believe it when they came out. They arrayed for the first battle in over three years. And with jaws practically dropping, they noted the dust clouds coming down from Mount Othrys, heard the clarion call of the trumpets of the king's army. Skirmishes and strikes had been done from both parties for all that time, but never a battle. It was on this very day that my sisters and I finally brought our forces to bear. Our brothers did not know it, could not discern us, for we hid our forces in banks of fog and mist. Neither side knows of our advent, and above, Demeter, Hestia and I float, clad not in flesh but in light. We watch from on high, the Titans come. The King has been busy in the years between battles, for so much of his force is now beasts of war. Twisted horrors of his devising. But still he has many a Nereid, Oceanid, or Elemental deity. And our brother's army is suddenly looking farther smaller. Again they break into three. Again they take the same flank and central positions. Yet this time, their seconds are switched, for Kratos now cleaves to Poseidon, and Bia, who is Via, hoves to Hades. Perhaps my brother Zeus believes the forces will be more balanced, or perhaps he just believes that Kratos has more chance of controlling Poseidon than did Via. The Titans are, if anything, almost blasé about this situation, it appears, for their leadership are again in chariots or amongst the skies. They seem to be hungry for the fray, almost like they can barely contain their feral lust for carnage. The defeat those years ago has never been avenged, and today they think they are about to end what they started that day. It is good for our brothers that we are here, for Tethys and Okeanus were not wrong. Many joined our banners. The dawning sun's reds become yellows. The heat haze rising from the plain grows as the titans scorch the lands again, putting pressure on the descendants of Erebus and Nyx to counter. But by doing so, they identify where they are on the map. The titans act decisively and send their brightest lights to those points attempting to neutralize Thanatos and Styx, Coas, Creus, and Hyperion strike. As before, it is a gruesome affair, but so distant above, 
so complex in its dance that none can fathom its individual movements. Below, the armies charge again. It is so similar in many ways until we intervene. For again, Poseidon moves forward, yet as he plows through the enemy, a whisper comes to his ear. Break right, brother. Pallas comes from that quarter. Head him off from Kratos. And on the left flank, so was it with dark Hades, for Demeter sent rumblings through his feet, aimed only at him. And as the ground vibrated, a message was sent to him also. The enemy attempt to cut your force in half as before, but this time, Atlas is close. Astraeus is bait, she said, and I, I got to warn my golden brother, I got Zeus. I watched as he was everywhere at once, his charioteer Nike working for two as Zelos was still not recovered. Still, yet the two worked in tandem perfectly timed, and I was there to help also. Zeus. Kira? You must move. Iapetus comes from your right. He will break through and then come at you. Prometheus has the reins. He cannot be diverted. How know you these things? Just move. Aye, I will. But not where he wants. And at that, he swept backwards, yet to the right also, and he sprung his own trap by my aid. For as Iapetus charged through the melee, it was Zeus that came in and hit his chariot side on. The steeds of Zeus's chariot were Kurites, gods as well, but more base, so they charged willingly into the beasts that drew the chariot of Iapetus. The steeds tearing into one another, the chariots went over, and Zeus was ready. He came down with his bronze sword and near took off the head of Epimetheus, forcing Prometheus to dive in and take the blade on his own to block it. But Zeus then struck his foot up into the young titan's midriff, sending both he and Epimetheus back a hundred paces, the warriors on their course being knocked flat. Nike herself, victory, then went in and was easily containing the two. Easily. Yet Iapetus now righted himself. He bellowed and came in at Zeus. He moved so fast, a wind gusted in his wake, and a channel of men exploded into the air, and he was on Zeus. His spear darting out with expert strikes, the speed and accuracy of a viper, and poison dripped from the blade of his spear. Some vile excretions of the beasts of Kronos. Yet Zeus was fast, even more so than before, and he now countered every last sally. He did not give ground, he did not tire. He just smiled at Iapetus, and that made the general of Kronos all the more enraged. He bellowed again and raised up his spear. He took three paces towards Zeus in a flurry. Then, just as swiftly, he tripped on a spoke from his chariot and directly onto the outstretched blade of Zeus. And it was as if the world ended, for a clap of thunder exploded and all could see the dazzling light coming from Iapetus. His life's blood, his ichor, shone on the sword of Zeus that exploded out of his back. Iapetus looked dumbstruck into the eyes of Zeus, as my brother stared into his face and then pushed him backwards. Iapetus fell back and simply toppled over. As his body hit the ground, his spirit escaped his form. It was then the skies darkened and it was obvious to all. Sticks came down from the heavens in the form of a dark river, and she collided with Iapetus' body, and then the entire battlefield watched as she swept the animus of Iapetus into the ground. She was dragging him to Tartarus, and then he was gone. 
and it was then that the forces we had brought were revealed. At the very instant the lines of titans shuddered, the reinforcements we had brought unfurled their banners, coming from the fogs. An echoed clamour that seemed like a thousand horns resounding, and our flanks leapt on the quailing titan flanks, and they broke. The centre imploded as Zeus then turned on the twins, Prometheus and Epimetheus, and the foster of the two grabbed his brother and made haste away from the ire of the young cub. But with that, the army just dissolved. All three segments of the line were in full retreat, and for once, my brothers did not follow them. Perhaps they could have ended this war if they did, or perhaps in the panic, the Titans could have rallied and then turned the tables. I knew why. I had been watching them all for years, but most of all, I had watched Zeus and he was not allowing them to flee out of pity or remorse. He was shocked to his very core. He could barely stand. He had just taken the life of an Eternal. He had felled a Titan. He had slain his very uncle. And he needed time to be at peace with this. For all of the carnage and constant war, I realised Zeus never once thought he could actually win. Or perhaps, he never once considered what it really meant for him to win. The destruction and banishment into Tartarus of all who stood against him. And so, the battle was won. And that night was the sweetest in all of my life. For it was not just a celebration of victory. It was when we sisters finally moved into the family home. It was the night we joined our brothers on Olympus. And we came as not just family, but as equals in this war. For the first time, we came home. But it was not without its complexity. Because while Iapetus had been on the field for the first time in the war, Kronos, the king, had been busy. Zeus. We did it. We beat them. I beat them. It was my sword which took the life of Iapetus. My sword. His ichor was like rivers of molten lava. I remember how it burnt as it flowed over my arm. His body doubled over it, my sword coming out of his back. I did it. I slew the general of Kronos, my own uncle. His will now resides in Tartarus. This changes everything, for now they will not take us lightly, and now they will know fear, all of them. Perhaps even my father, perhaps even the king, Kronos. It did not have to be this way. You forced this war on me and my siblings. We had no choice. You gave us none. So onward to the bitter end. I ride my chariot back to our home, to Mount Olympus. I raise my arms in the air as I am drawn down the lines. Cheers. They cheer me as they have never cheered him. The adulation is intoxicating. But it ends soon enough. For I lead our armies back up the slopes to our bastion. And it is there that we are assailed by the results of my hubris. Carnage. 
Gigantes lie bleeding and dying, many without limbs, many already gone. The walls of our home are blackened and cracked, the doors dilapidated, as if neglected for a thousand years. I rush to the closest one. He lies on the ground still. His mighty head is taller than I. He opens his eyes, wide at me. Recognition stops him struggling to get up. His body is near destroyed. Hera now stands beside me. She asks the questions, but I know the result before it is spoken. The giant's eyes roll into the back of its head for a moment. It is trying to remember. The giants are mighty of body, but they are slow of thought. His eyes roll down again, and it whispers, It was the king. It was Kronos. And then Hera lightly touches his head. She then offers her hand to me, and I grasp it. Her skin is soft, her touch so gentle. Yet through her fingertips come the memories of the giant who witnessed all. And it is confirmed. He simply appeared. He did not step the skies toward them, did not shift from hawk or eagle to change. He simply appeared above them. The Gigantes shouted in fear and rage, threw boulders at him immediately, but not one struck. Because he was not there. The giant was confused by it all. The images, but I am not. Father appears in one place than another, almost as if there are many of him, but it is just Kronos. Shifts in time mean he can do more, be in more places, act decisively. He appears before three of them at the same time, attacking each giant with his deadly scythe. Arms and legs and heads come off. He slays many. When the last Gigantes present are so afeared that they will not even approach him, Kronos walks to the very gates of my home. He uses his mastery of time to erode them and walks briskly through. We do not see him again until he walks out of the mountainside. <sighs> I know him now. We have our spies, as does he. From all of the reports from his court, he was searching for something that does not even exist. The trick the trinket or power that made us victorious. And today, he now knows there is no trick. There is no item, no artifact, no gift from a secretly treacherous primordial. And this will be a poor day for him indeed. For he has lost his general, lost a battle, and lost all last hope that he faces anything other than his sons. And now, his daughters, that our power is no mirage. We are coming for him. And the vision goes dark, for the giant has passed. It returns to the loving embrace of grandmother, another loss. But there are more Gigantes than there ever were here. We shall call them for their duty to guard our walls. My eyes clear, and I let go of Hera's hand. She looks doleful. So do my brothers. I extend my arms and decry. Why so glum, siblings? The enemy has come to tarnish our doors. Yet he has achieved nothing. Nothing, I tell you. Hades sighs deeply and looks to the skies. Poseidon sneers at me. I am so confused. Until Hera looks to me and explains. Zeus, this is not nothing. I look at her bemused. Look at your army, your people. And I do. And I see it. 
The hangdog frowns, the long faces, the slack shoulders, the dropped jaws. Not all battles are won on the field, as you should know. You have been tweaking the beard of the king for so long. Have you never considered why this worked? And as she spoke on, I had that sinking feeling. She was right. This was not a nothing. He strikes at our very home. He shows our people that they are not safe. That even if they are victorious on the field, even in your fortress, they are not safe. To them, to your army, Kronos can act with impunity. If you cannot protect your own home, inevitably, you cannot defend them. Hades nodded solemnly. Poseidon looked away, barely containing his rage. Demeter and Hestia then did something remarkable. And before the entire army, before all there, they created huge tables out of the ground, living wood twisting into long pews on which to sit. And Hestia walked the lines of the tables, and in her wake, all manners of food and drink appeared there. And with a cheer, Hera took my hand and raised it. Today, we have won a great victory. Tomorrow, we shall rebuild. But tonight, we celebrate. The cheer was not as unrestrained as it was before. But it was loud, and it was there. And we brothers had great cause to thank our siblings, as the host of the Olympians made as many as we could. And across the plains, in the court of the king, on Mount Arthurus, a far more fraught night was playing out. Metis. The halls of Kronos were a stark contrast to the restrained but jovial pageant on Olympus. For the general of the king's armies, Iapetus, was slain. His formless soul dragged to Tartarus in front of the entire battlefield, and many were angry. Few could give voice to their chagrin, but it was there, barely contained, simmering. A dangerous time. Kronos was in a standoff with the heroes of his army. None spoke, but all glared. He had just raised a toast to a day of glory, but few saw any hint of lament. For his own brother, Kronos, did not even spare a word. None but the Titans themselves were there. No attendants, no army. No heroes but them. It was a scene set for a confrontation, and all could feel it. The tension was rent only by our procession into the throne room. I lead my sisters, the Titanesses, as we walked to array ourselves before the throne in one long line. I, Thea, Phoebe, Themis, Menemazine, Selene, Eos and Leto. The males of the Titans stepped back, awed by our involvement. For we had done nothing previously, always left it to our male counterparts, so an expectant hush permitted me the forum to address Kronos. Our Lord, our King, we have a matter to discuss with you. Then speak. We know how your army was bested this day. Long have we Titanesses been watching our counterparts. Your armies were outmaneuvered, outfought, and then outnumbered. It was the Olympian women, Hera, Demeter, Hestia. They have been watching, as have we. But now, they break their silence. They have acted in advising their siblings. They watch the field from on high and throw their strength behind their army. Hestia and Demeter heal their armies as they're wounded. Hera speaks to her siblings and gives them warning. 
Your armies are being beaten as they have begun to involve themselves. I cannot attest to this. I was not present during the battle. He then turns to his brothers and raises an eyebrow. Hyperion shrugs. Coas and Creus shake their heads in denial. The others all look on blankly. I can see it going through their minds now. Women, they are not worthy of our attention. There is no reality where this has taken the Olympians from defeat to victory. We are clearly mad. We cannot confirm this. So what is your answer, sisters? Simplicity itself. We demand the right to fight also. And with that, I see my choice of words is correct for his calm face now contorts into his renowned sneer. Kronos then laughs and points to the stars above. He then walks down and puts his nose practically to mine. I try not to flinch. Your role, sisters, is to watch the stars, to give the libations and tend the fires now looking at each of us in turn as he spat. Your role is to bring me the wiles to win the dates of glory. Nothing more. It is we titans who deal with matters of state and war, and in that I shall not be gainsaid by any, least of all by you. We all curtsy low and prepare to leave, but it is then that another voice raises. My king, why do you not see? We are not winning this war. Your brother lies dead, his soul in Tartarus. The Olympian women bring more forces to the fray. They are mighty, as are the Titanesses. You have not been there. You take the valour of the Olympians too lightly. Who is to lead us now? You? Do you deign to finally take the field? And at that last statement, all knew poor Prometheus had gone too far. Cronus's eyes widen and he takes one step towards the youth. All around Prometheus reflexively take a step backwards or to the sides. He is now all alone before the wrath of the king. Forethought? That is your aspect, is it not? Then tell me, Prometheus, what did your prophetic powers tell you would be my response? For one who claims to be guided by the future, you seem entirely unconnected to the here and now. Because if I had not already lost a soldier today... I would take your head. And with that, the scythe, the sickle of adamant, appeared in his hands, a thing of terror, the very weapon that castrated Uranus, the first king of the heavens. Prometheus now looked down, a sign of defeat, his voice practically a whisper. I forgot myself in my grief, holy lord of all. I beg your clemency. <laughs> yes, of course you do. Metis, take this boy with you. Dandle him on thy knee. Feed him ambrosia and wipe his chin. And when I next see him, Prometheus had best not be a mewling calf or I shall take revenge upon thee, not he. With that, he glared at Prometheus and nodded his head for the youth to follow us. We had all been discharged, dismissed. And as we left the hall, we could hear Kronos name the new general. Mighty Atlas! It has been reported that you alone of all my men have kept your head. 
not just today, but in all engagements. As the son of Iapetus, I can think of no better to take our revenge on the rebels. Will you accept this new role? Will you lead the king's armies? Will you bring the curs to heel? And all Atlas did was nod in agreement. If the siblings of Kronos thought ill of his decision, that they were passed over for a younger titan, they said nothing. For the king held the deadliest weapon in all of reality, and none believed he could contain himself if any other rebelled this night. And so, we titanesses retreated to our quarters, Prometheus in tow. We have done all we can. The king refuses our assistance. Phoebe asked if I had perhaps chosen the words on purpose, the statement most designed to cause a rebuttal from him. Of course, I denied it. Of course. But when the others left, I gained the eye of Prometheus. I walked to my apartments and was not surprised when he was standing inside them, behind the door. So, what are you not telling me? Kronos will not win this war. If he keeps going the way he has, no, he will not. Mine was not a comment on his character or strategy. Prometheus's eyes shot wide open. You mean? It has been foreseen. Prometheus stepped towards me, hand clenched into a fist, shaking with rage. How does Conos not know? Have you turned on him? Do you secretly work for the Olympians? Tell me now! He has refused our involvement. He has refused our counsel. He has done this to himself. Go on. What else? Why am I here, Metis? What are you holding back? Kronos knew of the events of the day before they even occurred. He knew that to take the field this day would cost him his general. Prometheus looked staggered, stepped back until his back was against the wall. He then slowly slid down it until he was near on the floor, head in hands. He knew. He knew. How can you support him? How? Why am I here, Metis? What are you playing at to tell me this? Because you are the only one of our siblings or sons who may listen. We require a speaker in the camp of Zeus. We need someone to speak for us when he is victorious. You expect me to turn my cloth? To betray? One cannot betray someone who has already declared war on you. He allowed your own father to be stripped of his power, to be co-signed to Tartarus. He knew. He could have avoided this. He could have waited for better auspices. He did not. He wanted Iapetus to pass. He wanted a new warlord. I see the truth of it. I will go. But I will not go alone. Speak to none of this, or we are all undone. Oh, I will speak to none of this. Mark my words. You will wait until the right time to intervene on our behalf. For if Zeus is told, he may let slip. You only refer to Zeus. What of his other brothers? Will their victory not then lead to another war, as those striplings bash each other to find out a new pecking order? No. It will be Zeus. Then I will go. And I will speak for thee and the Titanesses when the time is right. And with that, he winked mischievously and departed. On the morrow, I found out what he had done for he had gone to his twin, 
Epimetheus, and he had tricked his brother into drowning his woes. Zeus The laughter behind me is not full-throated, but it is there. I tire of the event, knowing that half of it was forced, for none drink as those who are afeard of impending death. He has done me damage. Kronos. We have won our first battle, yet our cause teeters on the brink. I must prove I can not only defeat my father, I must prove I can protect my people, or there won't be any of them as this drags on. I can still feel the steaming ichor of Iapetus on my hands. Still, I find myself rubbing the spot where his fluid spilt. I will never forget the look in his eyes. When he knew, when he saw sticks descend upon him, the look of surprise gave way to anguish as she enveloped him. My uncle, I am sorry. I am sorry. But you lustily fought for a tyrant. You left me no choice. My reveries are broken by the flutter of wings. And I look above me. And there he is. A bird of prodigious size, carrying a body in its talons. One of us, metamorphosized into the form of an eagle, a form I, myself, take regularly. I tear aside the enchantments that surround the being, and I immediately take up a combat stance. He is one of them, a titan. It lands before me, at a respectful distance, but not so far as I would need to throw my voice to converse and as his feet touch the ground, laying what is clearly Epimetheus on the ground, he transforms. And before me kneels the very charioteer of Iapetus, his own son, Prometheus. His head is down, he kneels, arms spread wide in supplication. I stand down from my combat pose, but do not let my guard down. He is forethought. He has done great damage to me and mine. Mighty Zeus, son of Kronos, Lord of Olympus, I come to ask a boon. A boon? From my sworn enemy? This had best be good, son of Iapetus. It is then that he raises his head and looks me in the eye for the first time. Lord, on the behalf of myself and my brother, I ask for sanctuary. Now gentle Hera comes out of the furore within. Shocked, she paces to my side in silence as I consider my next words. How do I know you are not a spy? He responds, you do not. Then he would be a fool to take you in, would he not? Aye, but for one small fact. Then speak it. Today he slew my father, because the king of Arthurus allowed it to be so. You can confirm this? No, not now. Not for some time, but I will. When the stars are in alignment, when the time is right. Cease your riddles, Titan. My brother is in no moods to bandy words. He then looked to Hera and practically whispered, I am sent by those who met with you and your sisters. They know you have broken the compact, yet their services were refused by Kronos. I am sent by them to assist in your cause, I know of the metal and meter of the forces of Kronos. I can be of use to you. Why? Why do I do this? Because I cannot serve the being 
who sacrificed my own father to the pit. Hera speaks for me again. This is good. She intercedes before I lose my temper. And yet you would join the forces of the man who actually performed the deed. You expect us to believe that you would serve your sire's own slayer? And he responds. Again, no. I will not serve the slayer of my father. But you were enemies then. And Zeus fought with passion and honor. I will serve the new king of this world. I will serve a more worthy monarch. So no. I will not serve the sons of Kronos who slew Iapetus. But I will serve the grandson of Gaia, the one she trained herself, the one who stands against a second tyrant. I will serve the true king of the world. I will serve Zeus. Two brothers I have, if we win at all. What makes you think I shall reign, and not one of them? Prophecy, my lord, and a healthy dollop of gut feeling. But how could we ever trust you? Hera interjects, and he responds. Because I bring my hapless brother with me. I love him, so I brought him. But by the same token, I love him, so you will always have him to hold over me. I know that if I am faithless, his life will be forfeit. Hera then looked long and hard at me, and gently, a barely noticeable movement, she nodded her agreement. I then turned to Prometheus. Then, for the time being, you shall be welcomed into our halls. But mind your own counsel, trickster. Remember it. At the first suspicion of treachery, your brother will pay for your antics. Now, with your leave, brother, I shall summon refreshments and our siblings, and Prometheus will tell us everything he knows about the forces of Kronos. Atlas. And so it has been years. Minor phrase, clashes and skirmishes. The portents have never sustained a larger engagement, and it was good that it was so. For the army was not arranged to my wishes. Long had I watched my father wage war. Long did I note his winning strategies and those have lost for him. Especially that day, now two full cycles gone, two whole years since last we fought properly, and in that time I have been busy. I have spoken with my brethren, my uncles, my cousins, and now we are ready. A day that both knew had to come, a full battle once more. And I show that I have learned mightily from my sire's errors. The Olympians feel that they have the advantage today. The stars in alignment for their cause. Yet I know them to be wrong. And finally, the king permits me my head. And I have been looking forward to this. A pity it ends so swiftly. But it is as I had planned. For the Olympians arrayed themselves as usual. The three forces split, as predicted. Yet when they advance, I reveal my hand. I use all of my own power, all of my potence. And I bring my clenched fists down on the face of the Grandmother. Orent appears in the earth and widens into a chasm as it progresses from me. And in the enemy lines, they are rent in two. As planned, all of my forces then veer into the one side, assaulting the enemy as a tsunami of wrath. And they cannot get enough of their forces to the other side. 
They withdraw before my army, but cannot escape in time. The power of Zeus and Poseidon on one side of the rent. Hades is harassed by multiple titans without support. Via is almost taken, but crippled for decades, I would wager. Kratos is brought low by my own hands. I smash him into the ground. But before I place my foot on his throat, the traitor comes in and snatches him from beneath my very nose. Prometheus. He moves with a speed none can match. Yet it is all in vain. For within only half an hour, the enemy is scuttling back up the slopes to Olympus, leaving a good part of their army on the soil once more. Bleeding their last, and crying for clemency to a darkened sky. And all the Olympians can do is watch on, as we make the battlefield our banquet table. No mercy is offered to them, as I unleash the beasts of the king to sup on their shattered forms. Despite knowing our strength, despite knowing our mood, despite knowing our dispositions, all thanks to the traitor, still I humble the rebels. Now, they will not come down from their heights again in a hurry. Hera I sit with him. The others, they still rage. Poseidon boasts that the enemy would never dare to cut him off that he would have risen and taken them all alone. He is ignored by most. We all know it is just rage. But Hades scowls at him now. No love is lost between them. For now, Poseidon is making capital out of his brother's errors. Not only Hades, who tactfully kept his mouth shut when Poseidon was tricked into leaving half his forces as casualties. Yet even to Zeus does his spite run, that if he were in charge, then none of this would have happened. And, to my surprise, Zeus seems to take this to heart. It is understandable, one might think, for it is the first clash of note in years, the first battle against a force now led by the more able Atlas, and a swathe of our army went down to the dust. He stalks from the halls, angered at Poseidon, but actually enraged by himself. He takes it on squarely. Unlike his brothers, Zeus leads. I notice him slip away into the night again. He does so love solitude. But tonight, it would not be in his best interests. I follow him and watch as he paces and pounds his fists into his palms. He is drowning in grief, cannot see a way forward. So I go to him. Leave me be, sister. My mind is dark, my thoughts darker. Zeus, you are not to blame. Who else is then? Who took the center? Who thought they could just do the same thing again and win? Was that tempestuous Poseidon? Or quiet and deadly Hades? Or was it braggartly Zeus? I failed here. I failed us all. While breath still passes our lips, you have failed nobody. Tell that to those who right now below us are the sweet treats of the horrors of Kronos. So, you are a boy, after all. What? I thought you had been made of sterner stuff, had been trained by the grandmother, had been prepared for this war. Did you think it would be as easy as besting your Korites? Did you think the Titans would simply lay down at your feet? Did you think you could wrestle the throne of the universe without setback? 
without adversity, without loss. He looked at me as if he has never seen me before. A change in his look, a wisp in his eye. Oh-ho! What fire you have here! Perhaps you should be the one to lead our cause, if you think it's so easy. Petulance, from thee of all people. It is not I who will wear a crown when all this is over. Do not be so sure of that. Even in his grief, the spark in his eyes draws me closer. The moonlight compliments his handsome features. You allow Atlas to thrash you here as much as the field of combat. His hand holds the whip which you use to flagellate yourself. There is no dishonor in defeat, but I have no patience for those who remain defeated. Your point is well made. So, seeing as you don the cowl of my counselor, what should I do now? You set yourself against the most powerful being in the universe. You have raised an army. You have won victories on the field. You have tasted bitter defeat. There is only one thing you have forgotten to do. I am all ears. You have forgotten why you began this war. I am so tired. I forget. Why did I begin this war, my counselor? Can you tell me that? As our aunt would say, this is simplicity itself. You took up arms against a tyrant, one who is unfit to rule. You freed us all, your brothers, we sisters, and you dared to dream of a better tomorrow. You must remember who you are, what you fight for, and why. The king is unfit to rule, so we need someone who is. If that is not you, then it is nobody. Be the better man. Be the man we need. Be the king the universe requires. And with that, he nodded solemnly, and then dove into the air and became an eagle. He flew I know not where, but he did not return for a full cycle of the moon. But when he did, I could see it. We all could. He stood taller, he smiled wider, he walked firmer. He did not request or discuss or question. He commanded. He was ready.